when you're trying to identify if this patient's on a certain point at this on this startling curve, are, are you looking at a patient with a low pulse pressure, a, a high pulse pressure? And does that does that matter? And could you use that to identify if they're on the dark side of that startling curve where they're they're no longer fluid responsive? And so I I can't remember which patient was A, B, and C right now as I'm not looking at the graph, but which patients did we decide was not a candidate for fluid? I feel like it was the we should start with that patient. Yeah. So so let's start off with that one. I got it right here on my phone. So so B has a elevated left ventricular and diastolic pressure. So if you were to look at B on ultrasound, you would see that uh, the heart is full of blood. It's not ejecting volume. And it's likely that that patient's going to have an elevated systemic vascular um, resistance because they're trying to compensate. So you're going to get that normal catecholamine surge and you're going to constrict. Now, the pulse pressure on B and C is exactly the same. And we'll say the systolic is exactly the same as well. And so that is where you need to make a differentiation. So you have a narrow pulse pressure on B, it's because you actually have poor ejection fraction, where on C, it's because you have really low volume during diastolic filling. But they both present with the same pulse pressure and we'll say the same systolic to just make all things equal. Mm -hmm. So so that's where uh, B and C were. Yeah. So that's a really important differentiation because one is essentially cardiogenic shock. B, and if I'm remembering correctly, in the middle is like cardiogenic shock, essentially where, yeah, like you said, they got a really poor uh, ejection fraction. That's the reason why that systolic blood pressure isn't coming much over like essentially the diastolic blood pressure, creating a very narrow pulse pressure. That's one thing. And, and like Tyler said, if you look at that ventricle on ultrasound, probably going to be very dilated. Uh, but on the other hand, you have a patient that looks very similar, uh, at C, but they're going to have a very small, uh, amount of blood in their left ventricle, even if the pressure is high because pressure and volume are not always, uh, perfectly related. So if that systemic vascular resistance is super high, which is going to be in both of those patients, but in that C patient, that systemic vascular resistance is creating a lot of pressure in the left ventricle but everything is just trying to squeeze down on a very small amount of blood. And so even if there's a, a large amount of systole and a large ejection fraction, the volume just is not there for it to move forward. And that's C's reason why they don't have a very large pulse pressure. Now, B, the cardiogenic shock patient, that is not a patient that you want to give fluid to because you're going to look at the heart. It's already been full of fluid. The problem is they can't squeeze it. And B, on the other hand, that patient probably has a very small amount of fluid in their ventricle and they will, they're probably on the very beginning stages of that starling curve where they would, as that ventricle is stretched more, it will give you more contraction back. But the problem is they both got narrow pulse pressures. They're both probably clammy. They both got, you know, a difficult to palpate radial pulses, but one's person, one person's heart is full and the other one's empty. So that's a difficult differentiation. And then just for a sense of completeness, we should talk about a real quick. Yeah, so so A has a we'll say a normal left ventricular and diastolic pressure, and I, I think maybe on uh, on this graph it's probably a little misleading because I it's smaller than normal. Um, but the the thing is, is you have a wider pulse pressure, and so this patient is likely. Uh, I think the way to say this is fluid tolerant. They're likely going to. There's not going to be any badness from from giving this patient fluid now you know, regarding that there's not venous congestion or other things going on in the body. If we're just purely talking about the heart, this patient's likely going to be fluid tolerant, whereas uh, B would not be fluid tolerant. And then right. C would probably be most likely to be fluid responsive. Now, it's interesting because I have left ventricular end diastolic pressure and SVR. These aren't numbers that we have, right? So all we're going to see in the field, if we don't have a you know, a swan catheter in or whatever, is we're going to see the pulse pressure. And so I know as much as we hate lines and, and throwing out random numbers, we keep seeing the number 25 come up as far as a, mm -hmm. a pulse pressure. So yeah. you have a patient who's got a pulse pressure and we'll say it's less than 25. The next move is likely to pick up the ultrasound probe and look at the actual left ventricle. Would you agree with that? 
Yeah, I do because I I'm this I'm on the same page with you. Like, I hate those lines drawn in the sand because when you looked that up, and we were looking at a CV physiology book this morning before this, it was it was saying if it's uh, if it's below 25, then cardiogenic shock for the pulse pressure, and then if it's uh, and obviously these patients are all hypotensive. Um, hypotensive, narrow pulse pressure. And that pulse pressure is really narrow. Like it's below 25 millimeters of mercury. Think that cardiogenic version. And then if it's, you know, it's kind of narrow, they're still hypotensive and, you know, it's above about 25, then maybe it's it's just because of severe hypovolemia in some way. And that person would be fluid responsive. Um, so there are some, and I'll put a link to that in the blog. Um, but yeah, there's there's some approximate lines but I could see either scenario where they could mimic each other. So I think the the question is, if you see, if you have a good pulse pressure, I think the patient is likely probably fluid tolerant. We were trying to break this down before, like a way to simply say this. If the if the pulse pressure is good, like it's it's wide, it doesn't seem very narrow to you, the patient's at least probably fluid tolerant. And, and you could try a trial to see where it goes. It probably wouldn't be dangerous. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, and it doesn't have to be volume. I mean, there's like passive leg raises and things sure. you can do to to see if they'll increase their their cardiac output. Sure. And then so then we have the patients with the narrow pulse pressure. Those are the patients that are hard to differentiate. Clinical picture might point you towards one or another. If this is obviously a hypovolemic or trauma patient and they have narrow pulse pressures, well, go figure. It's probably because they have a really low blood volume. But if you got an undifferentiated patient where you know, maybe it's maybe there's some medical stuff in nature. You're not quite sure if this patient has internal bleeding somewhere that you can't see with a fast exam or whatever. That's going to be the patient that's really hard to differentiate. But the heart is probably where you're going to pick that up the best at. Um, and I, I think that's where the, the assessment of the volume in the ventricle is going to come in play and tell you, well, it's, it could be low volume or it could be high volume. But either one, you just want to be I think maybe the take home message is that for at least this pulse pressure thing. Is if you have a hypotensive patient with a low pulse pressure, you have to be cautious because that patient could be very responsive to fluid or they could be not that that uh, fluid for them could be the absolute wrong thing. So another use case for for ultrasound. But if you don't, you should probably be careful with that first fluid bolus um, or like you said, try a fluid responsiveness a different way, um, uh, whatever your flavor of the week is. Uh, a patojugular reflex or a passive leg raise or like whatever it is that you're going to do, whatever is in your, your toolkit to figure out like, well, maybe let's just try this first. If the clinical picture is, is really leading you to think this patient's undifferentiated at this point. Yeah. And you could probably skip even looking at pulse pressure and just look at the heart on ultrasound. And, and, you know, if you see a hyperdynamic heart and you see clear lungs, you know, and I always like to put lungs into that as well, because Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that the lungs are dry and if they're, they're not, you want to try to differentiate whether that's from a cardiac cause or not, but looking at the heart, you already got it on there. Look at the lungs, look at the IVC, and then you take all these data points together and say, Hey, this patient may benefit from 250 mLs of fluid. And you try that out and you see, and if, if not, and they don't respond to it, and that gives you a little idea where they're starting at on that, on that curve. But um, I, I don't routinely sit there and, and look at pulse pressure, um, but I do routinely throw the probe on the heart. And if I look and it's hyperdynamic and I see that our ejection fractions 90%, that patient is likely going to benefit from some volume. And uh, it's just another feather in the cap of ultrasound. I mean, we can sit here and we can try guessing all of this stuff, or we can actually know by looking at the heart. 